Yeah, a <laughs> lot more stuff. Much harder. Okay, so this one, let's see. So when converted to an iterated, this was from eight, um, 13 one. So this is number six and 13 one in the homework. And this one down here is number eight and 13. Okay, so let me give you some tips. So when converted to an iterated integral, the following double is easier to evaluate in one order than another. Okay. So the question is, which order is going to be easier to evaluate this? Uh, so when we look at it, what, what do you think? You see an x down below and you see an x above. So right away, if you're, there's x's in both places, the only way that is going to be pretty easy is if substitution would work well. And when we look at that, if we were to let u be what's inside here, the 2 plus xy, the derivative of that with respect to x is y. And that's not in the numerator. Everyone agree? So that's why integrating with respect to what makes more sense? Y. Yeah, integrating with respect to y is going to make more sense. So we want to integrate with respect to y first. So our order of integration, we're going to want to do a dy dx on that one. That's going to be easier. All right, well, let's come down here. So this one says evaluate. And this one has the x on the inside here. Now, I, I didn't look at the whole problem. But if I st saw that problem right there, that's not the order I'd do it in. Because I see that. The derivative of what's inside the square root is 2y, and in the numerator there's a y. So if I was doing this problem, I would definitely switch it and do dy first, because substituting u equal x plus y squared, then du would be 2y dy. That will catch the numerator right off the bat. Now certainly we can integrate this with respect to x first, but I think y would be easier to do first. Now if you were doing it with respect to x first, how are you treating well, how are you treating the y's? The y's are constants. And so we have the square root of x down below. So we sort of think of that as x to the minus 1 half. And then we get x to the positive 1 half divided by 1 half. But this y squared would just be coming along as you go. So you certainly could do it with respect to x first. But I think doing it with respect to y will be easier. But that gives you a little bit of hint on those. And if um, you get tangled on them, we can uh, look at them on Wednesday. Yeah, so it says the x, b, y there. And because these are both numbers, these limits, you can switch them. Okay. Because it's a, a rectangle. Okay. You see it's a rectangle? Sure. Where is that rectangle? <laughs> Just to make sure, from the, the integral? Yes, yeah, so where is the rectangle? What oh, plane okay. does the rectangle live in? Yep, yep. <laughs> Lives in the xy plane where x is going from 1 to 16 along the x axis and y is going from 0 to 1. Mm -hmm. So that's the rectangle that should be seen down in the xy plane. And this surface, we have no clue what that surface looks like, but we do know that it's a function. Right? It doesn't go under itself. It's z equals that thing, so it passes the z line test, so it's a surface. And it's sitting above or possibly going through the xy plane, but it's, it's above or, or under that rectangle. So if it is above the rectangle, then we're truly finding volume. If it passed through the rectangle and went underneath, we'd be finding the upper volume minus the lower volume. And uh, then if it was all underneath, it would also be volume. And if it was all underneath, we'd be finding negative 1 times the volume. Yeah. Right. So if we're in my math lab and we see that, and we just we say, OK, we think it'd be easier if we do the y dx. Yeah. We could just flip it. Yep. And we should get the same answer. You will get the same <laughs> answer. Yep. yep. <laughs> And you can only do the, the, the switchy thing, though, is if they're both constants. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to see how to do the switchy thing when they're not both constants. And that's a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> the switchy thing? The switchy thing. That's new terminology. Why? The switchy Ooh, thing. Well, hold on. We didn't finish 13.2 at all. Oh, we didn't? No. I didn't even close. think to go back yeah. to 13.2. Not even halfway done yet. Oh, OK. Dang it. You're killing me. No, kill me, Smalls. I got to finish it. I know. I agree. All right, no more talking. <laughs> Just 
math. Just math. <laughs> Why was I, I should have known that. When I was looking at that stuff in 13.3, uh, I should have thought, wait. We should be on like number 57. Yeah, you haven't even talked about changing the switch. Oh yeah, oh yeah, this is, w oh that's why I was thinking we were doing it today, because we're doing it right now. <laughs> okay, change the order of integration, aka do the switchy thing. All right, so the order of integration up there, right now what you should be seeing is that the integrals here have limits that are corresponding to this domain. And then you should see that there's a function, they don't tell us what it is, but they say conceptually there's a function that's defined on that domain. So you should be seeing this in the xy plane, and you should be saying, oh, there's some surface that's floating above this. And this integral represents the volume above that crescent and below the surface. All right, what direction is the element if we're doing dy dx? Hmm? Vertical. Right? Vertical. All right. So the x's are coming from a constant interval, and that's what a vertical element represents. That x is coming from a constant interval 0 to 2. Okay? And the that element is capped by a function here and a function below it that are both horizontal, or you know, uh, not horizontal, but like that. Okay, so the the y limits are functions. We've got an element capped by a function, and they're bounded above by a function, and bounded below by a function. Now we want to switch it. All right, let's switch it. So first draw it so that we have a sense. So there's a horizontal element. So if we go to this horizontal element, what are the limits on the outside? So we're going to have f, we're going to have dx, dy, and for these, I think it's easier to look on the outside first. Doesn't matter. So we've got that element, and I sort of think to myself, okay, that element, there's a horizontal element for all of the y's between 0 and 4. four. And the outside integral has to have constant limits so that we end up with a numerical answer. The inside integral, then, we look at the caps or the bounds. That's a mathematical way to say it. The bounds on that element. Those are both functions. And they have to be solved for x. We need x equals something for the left and x equals something for the right. So the one on the left is x equals? One half of y. Yep, two. one half of y. The one on the right? Root of y. So root y, and we use the positive square root of y. So there we've switched the limits. So Is it positive square root of y? Because why? There's a first positive. quadrant. Yeah, so right, so that y equals x squared would lo looks like this, you know, it keeps on going. This half right here is going to be x equals the positive square root of y. This half over here that we're not using is x equals minus the square root of y. Okay. Let's go over to this one. So here, we're going to switch it so that we have f the x dy instead of dy dx. And so again, we started with a vertical element, but we want to switch it to a horizontal element. Switching to a horizontal element. Or How did you know which one to put there, just because it was on the top? How did I know which? No, so like dy way. is first, then it's a horizontal element. On the other part where you put the square root of y. Oh, I said that wrong. You put y divided by 2, taking the integral from y divided yep. by 2 to so the square root of y. Lower to upper left to right. Upper. Left to right. So if we're doing vertical, it's lower to upper. If we're doing left to right, it's left to right. I don't know if it helps, but one way I've always thought about it, like in Calc 2, uh, was to basically turn the graph, rotate mm -hmm. the graph. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, that, that actually, yeah, you can think of that too. Yeah, you, if you, see, you kind of, you turn it that way, you got the y equals x squared on top and y equals 2x on the bottom. You can look at it yeah, as long as you turn it the right direction. Yeah. If you turn it counterclockwise, like the, you know, like the Big Dipper's going around the North Star, when you aren't navigating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so right to left. The other way to remember it is if you have two numbers on the x-axis, to get the distance between them, you take the right and subtract the left. Right?
right? If you're at x equals 1 and x equals 5, it's 5 minus 1 that gives you the distance. It's right number minus left number. No. Left on the bottom. Left on the bottom. Le yeah, when we talk about integrals, we go, when you say 2 to 5, you mean 2 and 5. When you say the integral is from 2 to 5, the 2 is on the bottom and the 5 is on the top. So it's just further from the axis then? Yeah. Further from the yep. Like if that's the ground, then it's just the further point minus the closer yes. point. Yes, yes, exactly. The further point minus the closer point. So in this one over here, dx is coming first, dy is coming second. So if dy is coming second, then we want the y's to come from a constant interval, which means a horizontal element. And that horizontal element is going to slide from 0 up to 6. So that's going to be 0 to 6 on the outside. And then the inside, we have functions. So that element, we have a left bound and a right bound. Those are both functions, but because they're left and right bounds, they have to be x equals. So we solve each of these for x. So we'll have 2x equals 6 minus y divided by 2. And it's probably best to write it as 1 half y plus 3. Minus 1 half y plus 3. So that's the right bound. So that's going to be the upper limit. And then the lower one is x equals 0. So that would be switched. All right, well, let's look at another one. And here, well, why is it so, why is it terrible to have y on the inside? Because you can't integrate that. You can't integrate sine of y squared with respect to y. Right, so you literally cannot do it. Because of the y squared, if you let u equal y squared, du is 2y dy, and there's no y on the outside for that differential to yeah. swallow. It's a non-integratable thing. It's not integratable. Mm -hmm. Non-integrable. So we have to switch. So right now, let's draw a picture of what our, oh, these are, oh, no, I was going to, for a moment there, I was thinking it was numerical limits, but they're not. Okay, so the, the y limits and the x limits. Let's see if we can do this correctly. So the y is going from y equals x to y equals pi. So those are the bounds. Those are an upper curve and a lower curve that are bounding a vertical element. y equals x is a diagonal line. And y equals pi is a horizontal line. So those are the two curves that are bounding our vertical element. Now our vertical element will have x values that go from 0 to pi. So the uh, 0 to pi. So 0 to pi, right there. So the region that we're using as our domain is this triangle in here. And we just said that we've got a vertical element. So that's what we have. The inner limits are representing upper and lower bounds. The outer limits are representing the constant interval that the element slides, ac you know, slides across. All right, now if we're going to switch them, if we want to switch them, if we want to go this way, if we want to go horizontal, we now have left and right curves that are bounding that element. And the element is sliding from 0 to pi on the y-axis. It's actually kind of bad limits to choose with y equals x, because we're still going to get a pi in there, but we have to notice that the pi is from the y and not from the x-axis. So we've got to be a little careful to make sure we don't. OK, so the y's are now on the outside. Those are 0 to pi from the y-axis. And the x's are from 0, right, that's x equals 0, over to this, which is x equals y. Now that we can integrate with respect to x so easily because there is no x. There is no x. So, what's the inter so what do we get when we integrate that on this interval? If there is no x. 
So we multiply by the length of the interval. The length of the interval, when that's gone, if you just integrate 0 to y dx, you get y. Wait, I thought if you're taking dx, you get an x. You do. Yeah. But, but you then you substitute it, it in. Right? If you integrate, if you integrate one to four dx, you get three. Upper limit minus lower limit. Yeah. If you have just the differential. Oh, right. Now you can use u sub. Now u sub is going to work out so nicely. That's pretty easy. All right. Let's look at the next one. All right. Here, we have a dy on the inside. Integrating this with respect to y, it's kind of tricky. Because if we let, if we, we, we can't do it with that extra 1 in there. If it was just y to the fifth, we could make it y to the negative 5 and run. No problem. But it's not. So we can't integrate this with respect to y right now, unless we somehow make that a, a inverse tangent substitution. You know, oh, that's that would be kind of a pain because we'd have five halves and two and ugh, it'd be a mess. So we want to integrate it with respect to x first. So let's take a look at the domain and then switch it. So the domain, we have x's that are going from 0 to 4. And the y's are going from y equals square root of x up to y equals 2. So the domain is all this stuff. That's our domain. And if we switch it, if we switch this so that we have the double integral of this stuff, dx dy, then y is now on the outside. So y is coming from the constant interval 0 to 2. Because the instructions say to switch it. <laughs> <laughs> and it also make it a lot easier to do this integral. So then, <laughs> and we're doing it because we can't integrate it also. So they're telling us to do it, so we're doing it because we listen to the rules. And, <laughs> and because you can't integrate that with respect to y very easily. So when we switch it, we get a horizontal element, and then we have functions that are bounding it on the left and the right. So that function on the left that's bounding it is x equals nil. And the one on the right that's bounding it is? Squared. Yeah. So that's y equals square root of x. So that means x is equal to y squared. All right. This can be, still looks, uh, um, I mean, now we can integrate with respect to x pretty easily. So let's go ahead and go a couple more steps into this one. So if we integrate with respect to x, what do we get? We forget about the y to the fifth plus 1. That's just a constant. So we're integrating x. x squared, x squared over, two. over 2. So we get x squared over 2. And then this constant here is just coming along for the ride. And that's 0 to y squared. So we plug those values in for x. So we plug in and we get y to the fourth over y to the fifth plus 1 dy. Now u substitution, beautiful. No issues. Now we let u equal y to the fifth plus 1. du is 5y to the fourth dy. So there's no 5. Divide the 5 out if you want, whatever your habit is. So then you got it. But, or we could actually use our log rule, right? It's in log form. We could actually just say the derivative of this is 5y to the 4. So let's put a 5 there and a multiplication by 5 down in the denominator. And then we get 1 tenth. Immediately, the answer. That's probably even a better way to go. So we get that as our <coughs> answer. Why is there a plus C there? Uh, 
um, because that's the antiderivative without using the limits. Okay. But if we want to use the limits like we should, because we like to follow the rules, <laughs> zero to two. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. So one ten. Natural log of thirty three. Minus the natural log of one, which is zero, so that should be our final answer for the definite. Can you scroll up just a tad? Yeah. So that's our. We should approximate, right? Yeah, right there. Yeah, now <laughs> definitely type it into your calculator. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to make your calculus teacher mad, start approximating. Put decimals everywhere. <laughs> right one half is 0.5, <laughs> right one third is 0.3 bar. If you want to really see some fumes. I take pi out to 56 bar. places. <laughs> <laughs> you take pi out. <laughs> Starting pi is 22 sevenths. <laughs> 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 Don't do it. Just say no. How close is 42 cents? So I, I do have question, question. Ryan. I started working on this homework over the weekend, and I got uh, tricked up on plugging in like y squared, that last problem. I was plugging in for y. I kept doing it wrong. I realized I could plug in for x. So I, right. I got confused at. Yeah, right so here? Like, yes. Right. Because so I was looking at like, oh, I have y squared. Put that in for y to the fifth, and then I was solving. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got nothing. It doesn't make sense at all. Right. So the thing you have to remember is that you're integrating to get from here to here. You integrate it with respect to x. Okay. So if you integrate with respect to x, these guys are all going in for whatever you integrated with respect to. Mm -hmm. So if you integrate it with respect to x, then those limits are x limits. So we're plugging those in for x. And that's one of those things, yeah, it's easy to get a little bit yeah, tangled. I, just, I saw y squared, oh, put that in for y and solve, and I, I, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. Even close. Yeah, then you still have two letters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's not the problem. Yeah, is. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so whatever you integrate with respect to, that's what your limits have to okay. substitute in for. That makes a lot yep. more sense. Yep. All right, let's do another one. All right, nice image. So we have. The solid that's above the parabolic region down here in the xy plane and between the tilted plane 2 minus y and the horizontal plane z equals 1. So we want the volume of all that. So here is the beginning of six surfaces. We can have our bounding surfaces be lower and upper. You could have bounding surfaces be back and front. You could have bounding surfaces be left and right. All right. So oh, with curves, you could have vertical curves and find the area between, or you could have horizontal curves and find the, you know, integrate the horizontal element or vertical element. You only have two choices. Now we have six choices. Upper surface, lower surface, back surface, front surface, left surface, right surface. We have three distinct possibilities for these six surfi. These six surfaces. Okay. And Simple first here, they told us it's in the xy plane, so that implies the domain is in the xy plane. So that implies that we want to use domain down below and upper and lower surfaces, because that's where the domain is. If we use front to back surfaces, the domain is going to be in the yz plane. If we use left to right surfaces, the domain would be in the xz plane. So we'll get to those, but for now, right now we just have an upper surface and a lower surface. Just like when you're finding the area between curves, you do upper minus lower. Find the volume between surfaces, upper surface minus lower surface. So the volume between those two surfaces is going to be <coughs> we're integrating over a two-dimensional region. So we have to have a double integral. And we're integrating the upper surface minus the lower surface. And then we're going to have a dy dx. We haven't decided which way to go yet. It looks like the y's have functional uh, bounds. So let's go with the y's first and the x's second. The x's on the outside. Because if the x's are on the outside, we have numerical constants on the outside, which is best. But we could just transform that right now if we felt so inclined. <laughs> Absolutely. So right now, the way they've told us is they are choosing an element this direction right now. So x is coming from the constant interval 0 to 1. But you could, of course, switch it. So upper surface minus lower surface. 
Yeah. Upper minus know. lower. Yep. I thought you just told me today in my math lab that. No, in the math center. In the math center, sorry. Oh. That the <laughs> 1 minus x squared, we, we could not have that on the outside. It would have. Like, right, it's on the inside. But, but you just could, said you could switch could it. Not yeah. switch cleanly, do what we just did over here. Okay. Not switch, just switch, <laughs> not blindly oh, switch. Okay. So when they're all numbers, you can blindly switch. Right. But if there's functions on the inside, then you can't blindly switch, but you can rewrite your domain and choose the other element. So, so the, out, but the, the rule is on the outside, you have to have yes. numbers. We need to have numbers on the outside, so our final answer is a number. Okay. If you had functions on the outside, your final answer would be a function. Okay. All right. Just like when you integrate in here, this inner integral is going to integrate to a function. This inner, inner integral right here, you should be seeing this as a function of x. That's what you should be seeing. Because you integrate with respect to y, then you plug in the x's, and all of a sudden you end up with a polynomial in x's. So you should see that as a function of x. All right, let's finish this one off, and then we'll take a break. So... Uh, we're integrating with respect to y. So the outside integral, leave it alone. And on the inside, we have 1 minus y. So when we integrate, we'll get y minus y squared over 2. And 0 to 1 minus x squared dx. And then we plug in those limits into the y. We integrate it with respect to y. So we're going to plug those in. And we end up with 1 minus x squared minus 1 half times, we square that, and combine our like terms, if there are any. Let's see, let's put it in descending order. It's always nicest to integrate with descending order. All right, so we get a minus 1 half x to the fourth. And then we have plus x squared there and a minus x squared there. So those are going to go away. And then our constant, we have minus 1 half plus 1. So that's plus 1 half dx. So now this illustrates what I just said a minute ago, that you should see this inner integral as a function of x. That's what it is right there. That's the function of x that it became. So that inner integral was a function of x. And then to integrate this, and we're going to get uh, all that, 0 to 1. So we get minus 1 tenth plus 5 tenths. So what's that, 2 fifths? Zero don't give nothing. So plug in the one, we get minus a tenth plus a half, so minus a tenth plus five tenths. Did I add right? No. Four tenths. I didn't add right? I don't think so. You don't think so? Does anyone think that's right? Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Minus one tenth plus five tenths equals four tenths. Divide top and bottom by two. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, take a break. Jeez. <laughs> take a break. So we have a solid bounded by the parabolic cylinder. And the planes, tilted plane, y plus 1, and tilted plane, y equals 1. So y equals 1 is the right-hand cap over here. And then y, uh, z equals uh, y plus 1 is this tilted plane. Okay, now again they've told us let's use vertical surfaces because they gave us the domain in the xy plane. So that, no, that tells us that we have vertical surfaces to use. So the volume will be the double integral of the upper surface minus the lower surface. So the upper surface is x squared, excuse me, is y plus 1 minus the lower surface. And then we have to decide whether we should do dy dx or dx dy. I'm going to choose dy dx. 
So I chose dy dx, which means the element down here in the xy plane is going this way. So if the x's are on the outside coming from the constant interval down there. So now we have to figure out what the limits are. Let's look at the x's first. So the the x's are going from where to where. Well, we need to know what this point is and what that point is. We have symmetry, so we really just need one of those x values. But how do we find those x values? This line right here is y equals 1. So we take that y equals 1. We look at this parabola right there. And if we project that down into the xy plane, we're getting this. So. Everybody see that? So what do we so what is the equation of this parabola? That's my question. What is the equation? Do we know what that equation is? Uh, maybe. How would you think why would you think that first off? Uh, because it looks like a parabola. So Think about, think think about, about it this way. To each other. We can set y, yes. y plus 1 is equal to x squared plus 1, and then it's solved. So that curve in the xy plane is the seam between the two surfaces. It's the curve of intersection projected down onto the xy plane. Do we see that? We've got this parabolic trough. We've got this diagonal plane that shoots through it. And the seam where the two intersect projected down onto the xy plane is where is that curve. So that curve is the projection of the intersection. The seam is where the blue and the yellow meet. Yes, exactly. So right there, that's where they're sort of crossing. And that intersection projected onto the xy plane is the curve. So what we've done is eliminated z. If we go down into the xy plane, let's get rid of the z's. And the xy curve that we're left with, that is the curve down in the xy plane. So if we do a simultaneous solve, we have z Let's not write it as z. Let's write it as y plus 1 equals x squared plus 1. So we've taken our two surfaces that are intersecting, and we've eliminated z. That projects the intersection curve down onto the xy plane. If you eliminate z, you've taken the curve and plopped it into the xy plane. Can I have a verbal description of what the step is we're doing right now? What was that question? Uh, simultaneously solve the two surfaces. Just like you simultaneously solve two curves, you have a system of surfaces as opposed to a system of curves or planes. So you solve that system of surfaces by setting them equal to each other to find the, limit. To find the curve in the domain plane. So in this case, the domain plane is down in the xy plane, so we want to eliminate z. If we eliminated y, we'd be pushing it into the xz plane. And we're using the curve in the xz plane to do the limits. Yes. Okay. So now we do know that it's y equals x squared. So your intuition was good. And we're going from 0, excuse me. We're going from, on the inside, the lower surface is y equals x squared. The upper surface is y equals 1. Or the upper curve, I should say. We're in the xy plane, so these are curves. Lower curve is x squared. Upper curve is y equals 1. And then left to right, what are our x limits? Minus 1 to 1. Minus 1 to 1. So there is, there is the setup. Say that again? So why do we know that these, if, I think I just heard you. So if you want to then know where these two points are, you set these two curves equal to each other, x squared equals 1. And that will give you the x values for where they cross. And then this integrand here, the, the ones cancel. So you end up with double integral y minus x squared dy dx. And, and then integrate that. We won't go through that. That's straightforward enough. 
the limits that we're worried about right now much more difficult. All right, so to find the, the, the moral of the story right now, if we have surfaces, we set them equal to each other to figure out the domain curve. That's what we just did. And that's what you've been doing for many years. That's what we just did here, too. If we want to know where y equals 1 and y equals x squared intersect, if we eliminate the y, we'll get where the projection down onto the x-axis of where they intersect. Where do you get the y equals 1 that you're it it It's tells given. Us. The other one we can we construct. What was that top limit? It was one, I think. Is there two here? Oh, x squared one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would we go to negative one? That doesn't make sense. Negative one is over here. Oh, that's for the x part. Okay. Yeah, down in the domain. Negative one to one. Okay, so we talked about this last time that if you have the double integral of an <coughs> element, you get area. If you have the double integral of a function, you get volume. volume. So double integral of an element, you get area. Double integral of a function, you get the volume above region R and below the surface. OK, so they want to find the area of this region here. So let's try to set that up. Right, so we have x equals 0. Just start graphing all these curves. x equals 0, x equals 4, y equals x, y equals 2x plus 1. So that's steeper. It looks kind of like that. So you don't have to be super precise at first. Just sort of try to figure out where is the region that's trapped in between these four curves. So we've got four curves. Graph them all and figure out where the, the bounded region is. So it looks like right there. And now we need to figure out where all the intersection points are so we can set up our limits. Do you want to use a vertical element or a horizontal element? We're going to find that area. Vertical. Definitely. Why definitely? If you use a horizontal, you've got different curves on the left and the right all the way through. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you go up here, that's the left, that's the right. If you go here, that's the right, that's the left. If you go here, that's yeah, the right. You okay. know, okay. all messy if you go horizontal. So vertical. Now we're told that this is x equals 4 right here. So the x's are going to go from 0 to 4. So the x's are 0 to 4. And the y's go from y equals x to y equals, yeah, exactly. Boom. So that will give us the area of that region with the double integral. Now, you could have done this as a single integral also, like you've done for many years. Well, many semesters. <laughs> a semester. Many semesters. <laughs> no, you didn't calc one, right? Area between curves? Or is that calc two? Uh -uh. It's calc two. Oh, it did it once. Right. Well, <laughs> it seems like many semesters. I screaming if I saw this in calc one. It seemed like a lot of semesters. It's only been one. Basically, you've done it since like two years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't let reality interfere with a good story. All right, so that, that's what you would have done in Calc 2. If you were finding the area between that region, you would have said upper curve minus lower curve on the interval 0 to 4. Do you agree? And that's what the double integral reduces to. It's always going to reduce to what you would have done when you were finding the area between curves, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how a double can be used to find area. Just like a single can be used to find arc length. All right, next, let's do, I think we just have one. So good. All right, so wedge. We want to find the volume of this wedge. And the wedge is sliced from a, a unit cylinder, a right circular cylinder. We've got a right circular cylinder opening the vertical. The planes, and between the planes, z equals 1 minus x and z equals x minus 1. 
So here, we can visualize the cylinder, and we know that two planes are intersecting it. The only thing we really need to know is which surface is on top and which surface is on bottom. The cylinder gives us the bounds laterally. So we need to know which surface is the upper surface and which one's the lower surface, and which one's above and which one's below. This one's below. That one's below and that one's above. Mm -hmm. If you plug in z equals 0 into both of these, oh, did we say it right? <laughs> which one? You said the first one was below, right? Does everybody agree with that? If you plug in x equals 0, the one on the left is on top. Do you agree? Yeah. So if we plug in x equals 0, we get z equals 1 and z equals negative 1. I was looking at the slopes, which it, maybe, is that, maybe that's what you were looking at. Since this one's sloping down, so this one's above and sloping down, that one's below and sloping up. So we, that's what creates the wedge. So the one on the left is the upper curve. So, or upper surface, I should say, upper surface. So we're going to have these limits then. These limits are going to be based on the circle, and that we have the upper surface minus the lower surface. So upper minus lower. Now, when we look at our domain, our domain is a pesky circle. And that is problematic in the sense that Regardless of whether we choose a horizontal or a vertical element, we still have sort of shenanigans going on. So if we choose a vertical element, we have to go from the lower edge of the circle to the upper edge of the circle, which is kind of a hassle. Why? Now, why? Because we have square roots. Okay. Right? Square roots. OK, now let's put them in in uh, equation form here. So this lower one would be y equals minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And this one would be y equals positive square root of 1 minus x squared. So those are the inner limits. The negative square root to the positive square root. And then uh, how about the x limits from where to where? Minus 1 to 1, all the way across. So let's take this couple steps in, because this does not look trivial yet. Let's go from minus square root to positive square root. What's going to happen in here? Looks like 2 minus 2x. Or we can factor out a 2 and integrate 1 minus x. Everybody all right with that? OK, so integrating with respect to y. Do you see a y in that integrand? No. No. No y. So that's all constant. So we get the length of the interval. When there is no y, and you're integrating with respect to y, you get upper limit minus lower limit. Upper limit minus lower limit. Square root minus minus square root is 2 times the square root. Upper limit minus lower limit, dx. So let's pull out a 2. And then we're going to have square root of 1 minus x squared. And then we're going to break it apart into two integrals. We factor it out that, so then minus x dx. Splitting it into two. Wait, why do you Oh, you're just getting in a form that's better for the Uh-huh. How do we integrate this one on the right? That's the easy one. U sub. Yeah, u sub works great for that. Square root of 1 minus x squared. This one use is. Sign. You could use an inverse trig function and go with trig sub, but it's actually simpler if we think about the geometry of what this is asking us for. This you can do geometrically. 
You could do trig sub, absolutely, with uh, x equals sine of x, or x equals sine of theta. But what is that asking for? Half circles. Half circles area, right? The y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared from x equals negative 1 to 1. That's asking us for the half semicircle area, circle of radius 1. That's just 1. That's pi over 2. Oh. Radius is 1, so pi r squared is the full circle. Mm -hmm. So pi over 2 would be the area of that half circle. Mm -hmm. Yes? So you could just give that the answer and not compute it? Not that is a computation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, so this is going to be area of the half circle, pi over 2. So area of the half circle of radius 1 minus, and then over here we're doing a u sub, and our u sub, we're letting u equal 1 minus x squared, so du is minus 2x dx. So du over, let's see, we have a minus x out there, actually. We could absorb that into it. So let's just divide by the 2. So minus x dx plus, we're going to get integral of, uh, of uh, what's that, u to the 1 half? du over 2, one half in front, like that. And then these u limits, we'll just wait on the u limits. We'll patiently wait. Integrate that with respect to u. So we end up with, distributing the 4 here, we end up with 2 pi plus 2. And then we have u to the 3 halves. Divided by 3 halves means multiply by 2 thirds. How come if you make that a constant, it, it doesn't become pi over 2x? Uh, that, we're getting rid of the x. This whole thing right here is representing the area of the upper semicircle. Do you see that? So if you were, if someone said, hey, what's the graph of square root 1 minus x squared, you would say this. Yeah. And this is minus 1 to 1. That's y equals the positive square root. So if you integrate the positive square root from minus 1 to 1, that's finding that area. Circle of radius 1 is, air, has area pi. So this oh, you already integrated. OK. Yeah. So the integral is just evaluated by what it means, as opposed to mathematically. It's geometric meaning. And what was our u, 1 minus x squared? So this is 1 minus x squared. And that goes from uh, back to x limits, negative 1 to 1. Does that contribute anything? So plug in 1 and minus 1, both give nothing. So we end up with just 2 pi. 2 pi only. 2 pi only. Okay, so let's go to polar. Polar is great. You're going to love polar. You will. We love everything we do in class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Okay, polar. So what we're doing is looking at our domain, and there are some domains, like the last one worked out just fine, the, the circle, the disk is the domain. There are a lot of times where it will not work out just fine. And it's going to be a lot easier if you convert to polar. And the first thing that we have to understand is that we can't just do a straight conversion. The differential dx dy or dy dx, which in general we would just refer to as dA, there's not a straight correspondence to dr and d theta. And there's a little bit of algebra involved here. We're looking at a, a polar element. So this is a polar element there. And it turns out with a little bit of algebra, area of a big sector minus area of a little sector gives us the area of this polar element. Turns out that the area of a polar element is r times dr d theta. 
So the area of this element is, is comparable to the rectangular area. When you think of dx dy, you're thinking of a little teeny rectangle. dx across here, dy across there. So a little Cartesian rectangle. And so when we catch this polar element, the polar element's area is not just dr d theta. The polar element's uh, area depends on the r also. And so just hang in there for a moment, and you'll see how it works. It's not that complicated, but the moral of the story is that we have to convert dA instead of to just dr d theta. We get an extra factor of r. And that's because R matters. The further you are away from the origin, that creates a different sized polar element. Do you agree? Like if you think about the grid, dx and dy, it doesn't matter how far you go from the origin, dx and dy can be the same. But if you take polar lines, the further you go away from the origin, the wider that polar element is. So R has a, a role in defining the area of that polar element. So that's why the, uh, the R is in there. So this is a specific case of something we're going to look at in the last chapter called the Jacobian. The Jacobian gives us a way to convert from one coordinate system to another. And it creates this thing that a lot of us think of that as just a little fudge factor. If you're going from x's and y's, you got to fudge it a little bit when you go to r's and thetas. And that R is the Jacobian factor that changes it. And what we'll see. When we go to cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates, there's going to be another type of Jacobian factor that goes in there. So for polar, it's simplest. It's just an R. So be grateful right now. <laughs> it's just an R. So here we have, we want to find the volume beneath this cap. We've got this uh, paraboloid that's opening down, and we want the volume that's just above the unit disk. And so we know how we would have done it with x's and y's. Now let's try to do it with polar. And the problem with uh, x's and y's is that that function is going to be really complicated if you were to use the square roots that we just saw in the last problem. So let's watch what happens when we go to polar. So this volume, if we're going to do it in polar, we integrate the function converted to polar. So we have to convert that over. x squared plus y squared is r squared. And then instead of dr d theta, it's r dr d theta. OK? So we convert the function, the surface, to polar. And we convert the dA to a polar element. And a polar element is r dr d theta. Now we look at our thing down here, our domain. And this is so simple. What does r go from? r equals 0 is here, and r equals 1 is the outer disk. So r is going from 0 to 1. If your disk was radius 5, centered at the origin, you go from r equals 0 to r equals 5. So pretty simple. And then theta, since we have an entire disk, goes 0 to 2 pi. Now, if you imagine doing this like we did a couple slides ago, where you had the positive square root on top, the negative square root on bottom, and it turned out fine and we were able to use geometry, if you have a function in here that's complicated at all, that method just won't work. You'll get to something you can't integrate. But with polar, we have limits that are constants. So that's as easy as it gets when we have constant limits of integration. Is there a reason you're doing the dr first? And then theta? That's just the tradition, is to do dr d theta. Because these are both constants, you could definitely switch them. Okay. Definitely switch them. More often than not, theta will be more likely to come from a constant interval than r. More than likely, like if you had a cardioid, your r values would not be constants. It's more likely that theta is a constant, so that's why they traditionally put it on the outside. But certainly here, where both are limits of, that are constants, you could just switch them, blindly switch them. Now here's an observation. Do you see a theta in here anywhere? No theta. So what do you think the integration with respect to theta is going to give us in totality? 2 pi. 2 pi. It's going to give us the length of this interval, upper limit minus lower limit. So this whole integral with that differential, that's all equal to 2 pi. So you can always the case. Always the case. If there's no theta in there, you're going to get whatever the length of the theta interval is. Yep, always the case. 
If you don't want to do that right away, you can just let it linger until you evaluate the inside and then you'll get it. But either way will work totally fine. So let's integrate this here then. So 4r, and we integrate that, we get 4r squared over 2, so we get 2r squared minus, that's going to be in r cubed, so we get r to the fourth over 4, and that's 0 to 1. The 0 doesn't contribute anything. The 1 gives us a 2 minus a fourth. So 8 fourths minus 1 fourth is 7 fourths, so 14 fourths, which is 7 pi over 2. Seven pi over two. So that's the volume above that disk and below that paraboloid. Now they want us to mix it up. Here they say, now let's consider part of an annulus. So they say, let R go between one and two. So that's an annulus. A washer. And then and then theta though is only going from minus pi over two to pi over two. So we're only considering this part of the annulus. Right in there. So that's what we're integrating on. That's our domain. We still have this paraboloid. Was it opening up or down? Down? So we still have this paraboloid out here, and we're just trying to find the volume beneath the paraboloid that sits on top of that semi-annulus. All right. Nothing has changed except that the r and theta limits are different constants. So let's go back up to where we were and see if we can rewrite it. So we're going to have the double integral. The outside was theta. Theta went from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And r, we said, is going from 1 to 2. And then uh, what was our simplified integrand? So 4r minus r cubed. And that's dr d theta. Is there a theta in there? Nope. nope. Would there possibly be a theta because the inner limits had theta in it? Nope. Nope. No theta anywhere. The length of that interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, the length of that interval is pi. Wait, you forgot to add the extra r. I multiplied it in because oh. we had already used it. Okay. We used it here, so this is all the same, so it's 4r minus r cubed. Got it. And then when we integrate that with respect to r, we get the same thing, 2r squared minus r to the fourth over 4, 1 to 2. So here we get lots of activity, and that's pi is sort of multiplied by all that. So plugging in the, f the 2, we get 8 minus 4, which is 4, minus 2 minus the fourth. So 8 fourths minus 1 fourth, some fourths. Leave, double check. Good for you. Oh, 16 minus 7, 9 fourths, so 9 pi over 4. Yeah. Hmm. 9 pi over 4. So that's the volume sitting above that partial washer and below that paraboloid, parabolic cap. Hmm. So solid. All right, now we have uh, another situation where we should probably go to polar. Whenever you see a disk as the domain, Polar probably makes the most sense, almost always, especially if your function's got x squares and y squares in it, where you can convert the polar pretty easily. So if we want the volume here, the volume will be the double integral. Convert to polar, so we have 5 minus the square root of 1 plus r squared, and then r dr d theta 
r is going to go from 0 to 2, theta 0 to 2 pi. Well, that's it. That's the volume. What's the volume on that disk below that surface? So we'll distribute the r. Oh, once again, there's no theta, nor will there be a theta after the inner integration. So you could just get rid of the 2 pi right away. And then we'll split this up. So we're going to have the integral from 0 to 2 of 5r minus r square root of 1 plus r squared dr. Got that. So we end up with 2 pi. This one, we get 5 halves r squared 0 to 2. This one, we're going to let u equal 1 plus r squared. So du will be 2 r dr. So we're going to get a du over 2. And those limits will be the limits of u. Let's switch them to u. And I know Sharon and I were talking earlier, and sometimes we, we, I usually just go all the way back to the original limits. But let's switch these just for a change. If r is 0, u is 1. If r is 2, u is 5. So you can always switch them, or you can always go back to the original. And there's no best way. Doesn't matter. It's your preference. So what do we end up with here? 10 minus 1 half times u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves. And then those u limits, 1 to 5. So we're going to end up with uh, 2 pi minus 10 minus 1 third multiplied by 5 to the 3 halves minus 1. That doesn't simplify very easily, so leave it like that. Now, some books will love to write this as 5 root 5. Yeah, actually, my math lab is like Yes, five. 5 root 5 is, some books don't, some books do. Uh -huh. 5 root 3 has. Square root of 5 cubed is root 5 root 5 root 5, which is 5 root 5. Q. So we added 1 to the exponent of 1 half. Yeah. Oh, no, you're right, you're right. So we get 3 halves. We have to divide by 3 halves, which means multiply by 2 thirds. Okay. Thank you. Makes sense? OK. One. This is the same problem. They said just use different domain. Let's set this one up. So our volume will be the double integral. Okay. Uh, theta is on the outside, so minus pi over 2 to pi. Then on the inside, root 3 to root 15. And then we're, we have the same exact integrand. So let's go up here to our integrand. So we had 5r minus r square root of 1 plus r squared. And then dr to theta. And we do it the exact same way. 5r squared over 2, substitution here, plug in the limits, and I won't go through that since it's the same process. But set up just a little bit different. And there, again, you can say there's no theta, so you could easily just multiply right away by 
What's the length of this interval? Three pi over two. Three pi over two. Mm -hmm. Three pi over twos. Let's try this one. So here we have another annulus as our domain. Partial annulus. Radius one, radius two. Okay, so the come on, circle get in there, get symmetric. Okay, so radius is going from one to two, and we're only considering zero to pi. So the top half of this annulus. That's our domain. This surface, who knows what the heck it looks like? It's sitting on top of that. So we want to figure out the volume. So we're integrating that. This is finding volume. We're going to go to polar. So we're going to have an r dr d theta instead of a dA. Oh, pretty good. <laughs> we're doing all right. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> Super kind. Checking in with random classes. <laughs> Do you agree with that? You don't. Really? <laughs> so r equals 1 is the circle of radius 1. r equals 2 is the circle of radius 2. Beta goes from 0 to pi. And then they tell us that the integrand is this. The dA, that part is what we rewrite. Yeah. dA, if we were in Cartesian, we would do dx dy or dy dx. But in polar, we do r d r d theta. So that's what the numerator is. And then the denominator, we convert. We have x squared plus y squared. That looks so dark. We have x squared plus y squared, and that turns into r squared. Now does it make sense? DA means R D R. DA means R D R D theta. So in Cartesian, DA means dx dy or dy dx, but in polar it means R D R D theta. R D R D theta. And this one, we're almost done. This is an immediate integral. What's the derivative of the denominator? 2R. 2R. So let's put a 2 right there and a 1 half out in front. Now it's in log form. And here we have two choices. This time, let's suppose I didn't notice that there was no theta. Let's just leave that outer integral here. It's going to go away all by itself in a minute, but we could just wait. So the one half I, I want the denominator's derivative to be in the numerator, so I multiply top and bottom by 2. Because then it's in log form. Oh, yeah, yeah. So then we're just focusing on the inside. We're going to leave the outside alone, just focusing on the inside. That integrates to the natural log of 1 plus r squared from 1 to 2. So again, let's just leave the, if it's not obvious to you that theta interval is just going to collapse and turn into the length of the interval, just leave it till the end. So then in here we get natural log of 5 minus natural log of 2. Natural log of 5 minus natural log of 2 is natural log of 5 halves. And now isn't that just a constant? That's just a constant, so it can jump to the front. And when that constant jumps to the front, we have 1 half natural log of 5 halves. And now we just have the integral of d theta from 0 to pi. Pi. That's just pi. We'll put the pi right there. And so that's how it will always be. If there is no pi, if, if, excuse me, if there is no theta, you're always just going to get the length of the interval. Adam? Weird question. Could you bring the pi over 2 inside so you have natural log of pi halves raised to the pi over 2 power? You could. <laughs> Usually the convention is to not bring irrational exponents up there. Usually what they do. 
You know, but absolutely, you could. The law of logs allows you to do that. You, know, you want to raise it to the pi house power. Now that's power. Pi house power. <laughs> pi house power. All right, let's try another one. Sketch the following regions. Then express the double integral of f as an iterated integral for r. So again, double integral means that usually you have an r and a da. Iterated integral means you've broken it apart and you have x limits and y limits and a dx dy or a dy dx. In practice, usually we just call both double integrals. It's too complicated to always distinguish, but technically there is a difference. Okay, so double integral to find the area or to find the um, the volume beneath F on R. So the region outside the circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. Circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. Looks about like that. Circle R equals 4 sine of theta. Let's make sure we remember how to find that one. So... All right, so that one. What is r when theta is 0 over there? 0. When theta is pi over 2, sine of pi over 2? 1 multiplied by 4, so we get up here, 4. When theta is pi, sine of pi is 0. So in this direction, we're back at 0. So you can tell then that this is a circle that's sitting on the x-axis. And its radius is 2, so it's going to be roughly more or less. More or less. So something like that. Relative, relative shape. OK, so describe the general region. Oh, they didn't do too much there. OK. So the domain that we're looking at is the intersection here. No. Just outside of that. Oh, other intersection. That one? Yeah. So inside the second one and outside the first one. Oh, yeah, that's it. Cool. So we know what the inner R is. We know what the outer R is. But we have, to we have to do a little math to figure out what the, oh, and let's convert that dA into an r d r d theta, r d r d theta. So the inner r, so we're, if you wanted to draw elements like we are comfortable drawing, our element is like this. It's a polar element. So it's emanating from the pole and going out. So that's our polar element. This would be considered the inner curve, and that would be considered the outer curve. So it's from 2 out to the curve 4 sine of theta. So 4 sine of theta is the outer curve. The inner curve is 2. And what about our theta values? We need to know theta. That's where theta starts. And then theta sweeps counterclockwise over to the other ray, and to find those values of theta, we set the curves equal to each other, eliminate r, and solve for theta. So we're going to set the two curves equal to each other. So we have 2 equals 4 sine of theta. So 1 half equals sine of theta. And 1 half is equal to the sine of theta at pi over 6 and at 5 pi over 6. Bada bing. That is cool. Exactly. All right. So polar is not so bad. Right? Not too bad. 
until you get to cardioids. Oh, cardioid. All right, so sketch each region and use a double integral to find its area. And, and we, this is essentially, we've already done this kind of thing, but when we did it before, we were finding the area using um, just a, another technique, single integral instead of a double. So here we want to be, we have a circle of radius one, centered at the origin, and cardioid one minus cosine theta. So we need a couple of test points to figure out where the dimple in the cardioid is. So let's go, theta equals zero. And when theta is zero, cosine of zero is? One. One minus one? Zero. Pi over two, cosine of pi over two? Zero. zero. One minus zero? One, right there. Pi, cosine of pi? Negative one, one minus minus one? Two. Three pi over two, cosine of three pi over two is zero, one minus zero is one, so we see that the dimple is this direction. All right, so this says inside the cardioid and inside the circle. So in this case, that, all of that. A little mini cardioid. A mini cardioid. <laughs> so cute. So cute. Kidney. It's a kidney. It should be rainbow colored. It should be. <laughs> it should be. It should be. It's such a cute cardioid. <laughs> we should, we're gonna make it. Yeah, it looks like a baby. Oh, no. <laughs> it looks like a fetus. It says now. Can you get away from us? <laughs> Kidneys. Oh man. I've got a friend that's got some weird kidney disease. Her kidney's like five times the size of a regular kidney. It's got all these cysts all over it. Oh, polycystic kidney disease. I think that's it. <laughs> the thing's like this big. It's crazy. All right. Uh, let's find the area of the that object. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. Whatever it looks like to you. Oh, no. All right. So. <laughs> so first off, the, if you think about this, we can use some symmetry here. And over here, we just have a semicircle. So we can just do, use geometry to find the area of that. So the part is this little eyeball thing here. We want the, that. <laughs> we want the area of that right there. So if we drew a polar element, the polar element's going to go out like that. So we're going from r equals zero as the inner curve out to that cardioid as the outer curve. So let's see if we can piece that together into an integral. So our area is going to be one half pi r squared. That's going to be the whole left side, the half circle. Everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. And then plus two times the integral. I'm going to do one of those, one of those regions there. We're going to go from, uh, we're supposed to use a double integral, so let's put a double integral there. And we're going to use r d r d theta, because we're just finding area with a double. So you integrate a differential to get area. And then r is going to go from 0 out to the cardioid, so 0 to 1 minus cosine theta. And then theta is going to go from 0 to pi over 2. That will be our area. <coughs> Bless you. Where is the pi over 2 coming from? So the, the limits here, theta equals 0 is giving us this point, and theta equals pi over 2 is giving us this point. Okay. So we're just trying to find the area of that little guy right there. And then you're doubling it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And then we're doubling it. <laughs> so oh. funny. OK. So that gives us 1 half pi. And now notice here. Is there a theta in that integrand? No. But there will be. There will be. So we cannot just pull out the theta and multiply that by pi over 2. Because there will be a theta as soon as we do the inner integration. 
So we cannot do the shortcut here. We need to leave this outer integral in place. Integrate here, we get r squared over 2. 0 to 1 minus cosine of theta, d theta. That gives us pi, 1 half pi, or pi over 2, whatever. <coughs> Plus the 2 and the 1 half, those guys will go away. And then we still have our integral, 0 to pi over 2. All right, so we have 0 gives us nothing, and then we have to square that thing. So we get 1 minus 2 cosine theta plus cosine squared theta. What do we have to do to cosine squared theta in, to integrate it? One plus Power one. reduce it. Yeah. Or it would be 1 plus cosine 1 theta. 1 plus two. cosine 2 theta. Oh, yeah, 2 theta all over, all over 2. two. All right. mm -hmm. right so all 1 half plus... <laughs> Yeah, this is but Yeah, so we plugged in one minus cosine into R squared, and you get one minus two cosine theta plus cosine squared, but cosine squared has to be reduced to half plus half cosine two theta. Right why? That's your that's you tell you tell me why. Where'd the R square go? That's this. No, no. The other one from the area. Go down one. Hold on one sec. So we got we integrated the R, got R squared oh, into you two. Oh, you plugged the one in, okay. Yeah. I missed that. Okay. All right, so then we are going to have that. So before, so we can integrate all this now. So. Let's do the constants first. So that's 3 halves times theta. 3 halves times theta. Integral of minus 2 cosine theta is going to be minus 2 sine theta. Integral of this is going to be sine of 2 theta divided by 2. So we get plus 1 fourth. That will be 0 to pi over 2. Getting there, so that's pi over 2 plus. Plugging in pi over 2 is going to give us 3 pi divided by 4. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, so that's minus 2. Sine of pi, oh, that one gives us nothing in either case, right? Sine of pi or sine of 0, that thing's just gone. Minus. That's out in front, so this evaluated as zero is nothing. This value, oh, no more. That's it. So whatever that simplifies to, 5 pi over 4 minus 2. That will be our, that will be our final answer for area. So there we use the polar set up to find area. <clears throat> and if we were going to use the shortcut, we would have to uh, do just two intervals anyway, because that's where the inner and outer flip. You if we were to use the area shortcut there to figure out the We can't point. use the shortcut. Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah now I understand. Yeah. I know, yeah. Now I know which shortcut you're talking sure. about. Uh -huh. There's always we'll some shortcuts. Ones. So yeah, if you wanted to integrate here, you would yeah, you would integrate from pi over two to three pi over two, uh -huh. the circle. Yeah. So r equals one. Mm -hmm. So the r integral of r d r d theta yeah. from negative from uh, mm -hmm. pi to three pi over two. Yeah, that would give it to you. All right, should we stop? Yes, yeah. please. It's pi o'clock. Five o'clock. You know what happens at five o'clock?